Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. Thanks for clicking on the video. Today we are going to be reviewing Atomic Habits by James Clear. That is some shimmery lettering right there. This book is all about improving your life, building better habits, and getting rid of those old bad habits that we tend to keep around. Maybe you have some ideas as to how to break your bad habits, but those ideas haven't quite succeeded yet in the long term. So what Atomic Habits does is it helps you understand uh, what habits are, how to build them, the systems that are helpful in doing that, and the systems that are helpful in reducing or eliminating altogether your bad habits. The main premise for me that I took away from the book is that it's not our goals that we set that help us achieve whatever we're trying to achieve, but it's actually the systems that we either fall or rise to that allow us to build good or bad habits. It became clear to me that I need to have a pretty solid plan and structure put in place before I start a new habit. I'm not a person who can just say or, or, or put in my my iPhone notes app that I'm going to work out tomorrow at 9 a.m. For me, that's not going to work. What's What will have a better chance of succeeding is if I put in my notes or if I write down in a journal that tomorrow I will work out at 9 a.m. and I will do four sets of push-ups, four sets of crunches, four sets of pull-ups, so on and so forth. That provides an actual structure. I know what I'm doing. I know when I'm doing it. It's quantified, and it makes it easier for me to execute. I'm much more likely to execute that plan because of how specific it is. I also learned that I needed to be persistent enough to break through what the author calls the plateau of latent potential, which is this point where your initial progress has, you know, you kind of start like this, and then it slows, before you hit a point of exponential growth. And that time period isn't 21 days or 30 days, it's however long it takes you to get there. It's about attempting to be 1% better at the end of each day. And I remember a podcast that Chris Williamson had done uh, very early on uh, in his YouTubing career, and I think it's called Life Hacks 101, the video that he did on this where he talks about with, the, with two of his friends the Romwad app, which Romwad I think is spelled R-O-M-W-O-D, which to my understanding and how he explained it is is an app that um, you know helps you stretch. It comes up with routines for you so that you can become more flexible and durable and things like that. And he and his friends were talking about how they didn't even realize the full benefits of doing those stretches until about a year after they started. And I think that that's the perfect uh, case study for just getting 1% better every single day and breaking through that plateau I was talking about of latent potential because you kind of, you know, you get going, you feel good, and you hit that plateau, and then the exponential growth comes. And check this out. Winners and losers have the exact same goals. I'm assuming... Every NFL team goes into the season wanting to win the Super Bowl. I'm also assuming that every golfer wants to win the Masters or another major. But the goals they set don't put in the work to help them succeed. It's the systems that they put in place that help them succeed. There's a quote in the book that says, fix the inputs and the outputs will fix themselves. Another quote for you, fall in love with the process rather than the product. Now, in the early 2010s, I believe it was Tiger Woods who gave interview after interview after one of his you know, many back surgeries, and he kept talking about how it would be a process to get back to where he was before. And he kept talking about how he's he's going to just work out and he's going to try and get his flexibility back and kind of tweak his swing so he's not putting as much torque on his back. And he would talk about pitching and putting and starting small there, working his way up to mid irons, long irons, woods and drivers, so on and so forth. But he did refer to that as the process. Now, the book says to start by working backwards from the results you want, and then ask yourself, who is the person that you need to be in order to achieve those results? Now, along the way, James Clear says that behaviors followed by satisfying consequences tend to be repeated, and those that produce unpleasant consequences are less likely to be repeated. Now, that got me to think. The question then becomes, how do we stay motivated to repeat positive habits that do not produce a perceived immediate satisfying consequence is the answer to that perseverance because then if so what are the best ways to manufacture perseverance now the author says in the book that behaviors followed by satisfying consequences tend to be repeated more so than those that are followed by unpleasant consequences so that got me to think about habits or behaviors that we know are positive but what if they uh, do not produce a perceived immediate satisfying consequence. I mean, do we just persevere through that and 
I mean, if, if perseverance is the answer, then how do we manufacture perseverance in that moment? Now, before I answer that, please comment down below. Let me know your thoughts on the book and like the video if you're enjoying this so far. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more content. Now, back to perseverance. So if we know of a habit that is good, but there is no immediate perceived uh, you know, benefit or consequence to doing this particular habit, how do we manufacture perseverance? So for me, and, and he does mention this in the book, for me, you really have to make that action and that habit easier because if something is hard, we're far more likely to not pursue it. And making habits easy is one of the best ways to ensure consistency. Now, one of my favorite things in the book that illustrates this point is there was a study done with three groups of people. The first group was asked to track how often they exercise. The second group was asked to do the same, but were told by a group of experts how beneficial exercise was to their health. So these first two groups, 35 to 38% of them exercised at least once per week. Now, the third group in this exercise was told everything that the first two groups were told, but they also were asked to formulate a plan to exercise. So specifically, they had to say the sentence verbatim, quote, during the next week, I will partake in at least 20 minutes of vigorous exercise on this day and at this time in this place. Now, in that third group, the ones who had to say that, 91% of those people in the third group exercised at least once per day or once per week, sorry, which was more than double that normal rate of the first two groups. Remember the first two groups were at 35 to 38% of those people exercised once per week. And now we're up to 91% just by verbalizing, I will do this on this day and this time and in this place. And the point that the author makes that study is that many people think they lack motivation, but what they really are lacking is clarity and clarity makes your habits easier to achieve and applying that in my own life we'll just use the working out example again if, if I don't go into the next day not knowing like what I'm gonna do for a workout or if I try and plan it on the fly I tend to procrastinate working out when I do have a plan I typically work out sometime between oh I don't know 7 a.m. and 9 a.m. but for example today I had no idea what I was gonna do I, I scrolled through Instagram and I was looking for people who who post workouts and I'm like I, I, what the hell I need inspiration and I didn't end up work, I didn't end up working out until like noon or 1 p.m. and it just it makes you put it off that much more but if you have a plan like I said in the beginning you know four sets of crunches four sets of push-ups four sets of pull-ups so on and so forth it's it's a lot easier if you have that clarity that I'm doing this in this time and in this location this is how much I'm doing it so on and so forth. It makes it much easier on you. Now, in reading this book, uh, he encourages you to figure out, you know, your bad habits and your good habits and kind of do a self-analysis and figure out what makes you tick, what things you should address and what things you should amplify. And one of the things he points out is that you can't reward yourself for something that you're not aware of. But to add to that, I would say you, you I also don't think you can reward yourself for something that you refuse to be aware of. And there is a difference there. Now, there's a quote from Jordan Peterson that kind of uh, says this where, where he, he, uh, he talks about how people are often loath to figure out precisely what they are. They don't want to know because they'd rather be spread out in a half-blind manner in the fog, hoping that the place they're at is better than it really is and deluding themselves by remaining vague. Rather than trying to figure out, I'm right here, right now with these specific problems. But it's better to do that and figure out your, your specific problems because if you have a specific set of problems and you narrow them down and specify them, then you can start to fix them and you can start fixing them incrementally. Remember in the beginning we talked about getting better by 1% each day. Be better today than who you were yesterday. Slay the dragon in his lair before he comes to your village is how he ends that quote. And so for me, I tried to analyze myself and figure out what my biggest weaknesses are. And for me, it's it's finding motivation to do things I don't want to do, uh, you know, like working out. And um, I also tend to avoid conflict. And decision making, I think, was the third one. I, I can be pretty indecisive sometimes on, on things and I can over research and that can lead to indecision. So that's why I bought this book, Atomic Habits. I bought another book called Difficult Conversations how to discuss what matters most in hopes that that can address, uh, you know, my issue with conflict. So 
I'm going to do self-analysis incrementally and, and try to constantly imp improve my weaknesses. Finally, one of my absolute favorite points from this book is that your environment can be more of an effective catalyst to building good habits than motivation. There's a quote that says, a small change in what you can see can lead to a big change in what you can do. And just think about that. Like in locations, let's just take Vegas as one of them. I mean, Vegas is like a, a complete total atomic dopamine bomb dropped on you, right? I mean, you got slot machines and you've got uh, blackjack tables and everything there. Like they got drinks flowing. Everything there is just there for you to freaking go and have a blast. And, you know, it's 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 all catered to just one thing, really. Entertainment, gambling, that's all kind of wrapped up in the same package. And that whole environment is a huge catalyst for Sin City, right? I mean, another one could be like a church, right? If you if you go to church, um, you know, the music they play, the lighting that's there, um, you know, people are often, they can dress up, uh, you know, with an, there's an altar with, with people meditating. It's, it's very much for, um, you know, the kind of Zen, like meditation. It's all set up for that to occur. And the author talks about designing your environment to give you positive visual cues that encourage good habits and giving each room in your home a purpose. Now, like right now you can see I'm filming this in my bedroom, right? So normally I would try to have an office and he, he talks about in the book how if you have an office in there, you can have a notebook, your, your work computer and your camera, whatnot, whatever you need to do. And that's kind of the room you carve out that, that is a catalyst for work. And then once you leave that room, work is done. The mind knows that. And then when you go into the living room, you have TV, you have couch. Your mind knows that that environment is for entertainment, watching TV or maybe spending time with family, watching a movie. And you move to the kitchen. The kitchen is, you know, that's that's for cooking. Everything in there is set up. You got your knife blocks, your pots and pans. Like that's for one thing. And, and if you can set up your room to shift your mindset as you go from room to room and so on, that can be a really, really helpful thing in building good habits and, and cueing you to make sure that you get those done. The author says that he has never seen anyone stick to positive habits in a negative environment. Energy is better spent optimizing your environment, making the good cues obvious and the bad cues invisible. Now, the book is very dense on ways for you to improve your life and create better habits while minimizing uh, your bad habits. And uh, I highly recommend it. it. It really shifted my mindset and and, uh, and made me think in a completely different way on, on how to address building good habits. And I can't wait to hear your guys' thoughts in the comments. But until next time, have a great day, everyone.